Hi, everyone. Welcome to Disease Detectives. Um, I'm Stephanie. And, um, and I'm Sarah. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I guess a little bit about us. Um, right now, I'm currently a high school senior at Shadyside. Um, it's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I've been um, in the disease detective event for about two years now. And I'm also a senior at John Adams in South Bend, Indiana. And this is also my second year doing disease detectives. Cool. So I don't know, let's just get into it. So this is just a brief overview of what you will need to bring to the event. Um, so basically you have one sheet front and back um, of a paper that you can just fill with all the information you want. Um, you'll have two standalone like um, scientific calculators and basically um, those are just the things that you can bring to an event and then I just I should I guess I should mention that there are um, mainly two types of exams that I've sort of seen throughout um, my years of doing disease one is um, a test that's split into two parts one with a bunch of definitions and overall questions about um, just diseases and things like that and then the other half is um, maybe like a storyline of a case where you have to do more of the mathematical components um, with statistical variables and graphs and things like that. Um, and then the second type of test is just one that um, just follows cases throughout the entire test. Um, and basically you just have to answer questions based on this um, like storyline. So the first step, I guess, of disease is investigating an outbreak. And listed here are around 10 or so steps, um, give or take, it could be like 10 to 13 steps of what you should do to begin to investigate an outbreak. And basically, um, like most of the time, like the test will ask you to list um, basically these in order um, to just see how you would do that. And then basically there are also CDC steps to investigating a disease. I'm pretty sure there are five steps. Um, they're also good to know um, just to keep you in check. And then overall um, uh, disease is basically the field of epidemiology and science. And there's descriptive versus um, analytical epidemiology. And basically descriptive epidemiology asks um, basically when was the population affected? Where was the population vers uh, affected versus analytical asks, how was the population affected or why was it affected? And it'll basically um, test your hypotheses, identify causes um, of like an outbreak and determine whether an association exists between variables, um, such as between like an exposure and a disease. Um, and basically the last component is something called Hill's criteria for causation. And I didn't list them out. You can just find it online. They're just um, nine criteria that basically um, have to be met to establish a cause and effect relationship. Um, and it's basically like used to establish um, evidence between like a presumed cause um, and something that was like observed in a public health crisis to um, uh, see if there's an association between the two. So one important thing to know in this event is the different types of surveillance. So there are these, there are basically these four main ones. Um, so there's passive surveillance, which is, it's pretty much what it sounds like. So uh, diseases are reported by healthcare providers to health agencies because the health agencies aren't actually doing anything. So that's why it's passive. Active is when the health agencies actively contact health providers to get information about the patients they've been treating. Sentinel is when um, specific health professionals are selected to, to represent their area or their reporting groups, and they're in charge of reporting. Um, sometimes there will be specific things that they want, as in syndromic, which focuses on one or more symptoms, rather than a confirmed disease. And, uh, and it includes analysis of data to detect or anticipate outbreaks, but it can also involve just a general idea of a uh, sentinel pro health professional reporting anything that they find odd. So we can take pretty much any of the other three forms. Um, I guess the next objective is just 
um, transmission. And just three things that you probably should know are the difference between an agent, a reservoir, and um, basically modes of transmissions. Um, so basically an agent is any type of microbial organism with the ability to cause a disease. So it's essentially a pathogen. Um, a reservoir is a place where these um, agents can thrive and reproduce. And a portal of exit is a place of exit um, providing like a way for the agent to leave the reservoir. Um, so basically um, you should just like know these, those three terminologies um, in terms of just transmission. And then in terms of contact, there's correct, uh, direct contact and indirect contact. And direct contact is just um, person to person transmission. So um, it's just touching, kissing, um, anything in between. And indirect content, uh, contact um, occurs basically from a reservoir um, via an inanimate object or something else called fomites. So, um, these basically are encapsulated by um, like the list right here below, like droplet, vehicle, airborne, foodborne. Um, and droplet is like um, when you're coughing or sneezing, um, vehicle is um, transmission through food or water. Airborne occurs like uh, via droplets. And then um, just like some examples, like foodborne and waterborne are pretty self-explanatory. Like um, on your cheat sheet, you probably wanna add like that um, uh, under waterborne or no, under foodborne, you can have salmonella um, just be a potential disease um, under that. So when you're studying a disease, there are generally two types of studies. So there are case control studies, which are usually involve studying the frequency of disease in exposed versus non-exposed individuals. And it's usually better for rare diseases. And as far as analysis, it uses the odds ratio, which we'll get into more a bit later. And then there's also the cohort, which studies the frequency and exposure in individuals with and without a specific disease. And it's better for more common diseases because it's easier to find enough people. And it uses um, relative risk for analysis. It's really easy to get them confused. So like one important thing when you're first starting out is to like drill and make sure you know which is which and you understand which, um, which of the ratios to use for analysis for the specific one. So as far as prevention, of course, generally the goal is to keep an outbreak from happening in the first place. So two of the big things are to reduce risk factors and address possible weak points. And there are four different types of prevention. Sometimes primordial gets kind of left out because it can be lumped in with primary because they're pretty easy to get confused. But the general idea is primordial is designed to avoid the development of risk factors specifically. So to make it less likely that they'll actually acquire the disease. So it's usually one example of that is like promoting healthy lifestyles. So encouraging exercise and healthy diets. Primary is intervening to prevent a disease itself from occurring like immunization. Uh, secondary involves early detection and timely treatment of a disease that has already developed. So routine blood testing, for example, can catch something early so that it's treatable without invasive procedures. And tertiary is uh, managing a disease post-diagnosis when it's further along to slow or stop progression, such as chemotherapy in the case of cancer. Um, and then also generally, uh, I think that it's important to just know different types of diseases and add those to your cheat sheet. And that can be um, divided into mainly like infectious and foodborne diseases. So you'll probably want to list um, types of infectious agents, viruses, bacteria, fungi, um, everything more. There are so many different other types. And um, basically define what they are and give examples of different types of diseases that fall into those specific categories. Um, and then also, I think it's important with foodborne diseases to list a few common diseases that are foodborne. Um, uh, the CDC has released a lot of guidelines of how to, avo how to avoid foodborne diseases um, that I think you should definitely put on your cheat sheet because um, I've had a lot of tests where they've asked me that type of question. Um, and then just in general, um, like 
food, acidity, time, moisture, temperature, oxygen. These are um, all like, I guess, topics that you should put um, with each type of foodborne disease. And then I think it's also important to um, constantly update your cheat sheet or just look at the news to look at uh, recent outbreaks um, in foodborne diseases, such as like the E. coli outbreak um, in Chipotle a few years ago. Um, there are still a lot of tests that have questions about that. Um, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to jump in and say one thing, one important thing is to actually like keep updating your cheat sheet to go with the sort of things you see in your area because not every not every like region will have like similar tests. I mean, it just has to do with who's making the test because I actually haven't seen any questions that really have to have much to do with a specific disease. So that's just kind of an interesting difference that you might see. Cool, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. I remember like last year when we had our like regional tournament, which was like, I think in the beginning of March, um, like the disease test that I took was just completely centered around COVID-19. Oh yeah, I, th I believe ours was as well but I was not actually on our regional disease team. I think I had a conflict with one of my other events. Yeah. Conflicts suck. Um, and then just some additional topics uh, you might consider adding to your cheat sheet um, that have been pretty important um, for me just in taking tests and um, just like seeing how easy it is to go through and uh, get information quickly is a definition list. Um, so if you find just random words that you don't really um, think fall into any of the categories that we listed below, you might wanna consider putting down. Um, and then you might want to have them to compare and contrast definitions. Sometimes they ask like pathogenicity versus viral virulence or um, pandemic versus endemic or um, hollow endemic versus just like a, I don't know, I forget the other ones. Um, but it's just important to have these like quick, um, just like definitions that you can look at to sort of um, see like what, what, what's where and like how to differentiate between different definitions. And then also um, you might wanna add famous people um, like the founder of um, epidemiology, um, like Jon Snow, like, like, like a basic, like a few words about maybe like when he was born or like whenever like they um, uh, just established um, their like important contribution to epidemiology. And then also it's important to have some acronyms um, and then some specific diseases. Um, so maybe uh, you might wanna have COVID-19 on there or um, Ebola or SARS or MERS um, and have basic information like mode of transmission. So is it airborne? Is it foodborne? Um, is it through a vector like a mosquito? Um, and then basically some symptoms, incubation period, stuff like that, because um, it can pop up on a test. And then we'll just delve into some visualization techniques, which is basically um, the statistical aspect of disease detectives. So these are kind of the three main things you'll see on a disease test. So you have an epi curve, which is short for an epidemic curve, which is that blue bar graph up, up at the top. It's a visual display of the onset of illness among cases associated with an outbreak. So the general idea is to sort of like create a graph of how many cases happened when. Like in this particular graph, you can see that uh, the most cases happened in June. And this is helpful because a lot of the time you'll actually be asked to sort of work backwards because you'll be given an epi curve and you'll be given like an incubation period. So, and then you'll be asked to, to figure out like which date um, this particular outbreak likely occurred on. Or sometimes they'll give you a date the outbreak likely occurred on and an epi curve and ask you to figure out the median um, incubation period. A spot map is sort of a different idea. So it's meant it's a method of displaying the geographical distribution of a disease. So um, the idea there is to sort of visualize any particular clusters. So there's a particular case from a long time ago where um, they were trying to figure out why a bunch of people were getting sick and they made a spot map. 
And it was a particular cluster of people who used one particular water pump and that particular water pump source was actually contaminated. So it's just a good way of visualizing to see if there's like a big group of cases in one area. A line listing is the least interesting of them, to be quite honest. It's, it's a spreadsheet where each row usually represents a person or a case of disease. They are very important. They're less common because they're usually, there's so much information on them that the types of questions you'd see in an actual disease detectives competition would be more specific. And they usually don't have you wade through that much information. Cool. So this is a two by two table. Um, it's probably one of the most important um, tables or aspects of a disease test that you'll have to use when you're solving problems about a case or a storyline. So um, as you see, like um, you put disease versus no disease and then exposed versus not exposed and then you label them according to their letters and then um, basically what can happen is using these letters, you can calculate um, different values. So like Sarah mentioned before, like there's odds ratio and there's relative risk. Um, odds ratio, I'm just going to reiterate a little bit what you said, but it um, is used in a case control study. And basically it compares the odds of someone uh, getting the disease or no, like it compares the odds of getting the disease of those exposed to the odds of those unexposed. So an example um, after like a calculation would be like um, people like people who ate at place A were 5.8 times more likely to develop hepatitis than they were um, than were like people who didn't eat there. Um, and then this is the calculation right here, AD over BC. Um, and then relative risk is used in cohort studies. And it's basically the ratio of um, the probability of illness in an exposed group to the probability in an unexposed group. So this important chart, um, just with uh, four little things can tell you a lot um, about uh, basically an outbreak. And um, sometimes they actually might not give you all four of them, but you can look at disease total or exposed total versus, or not exposed total. And you can just do um, some simple subtraction and addition and figure out all the numbers. So I've always found it kind of helpful to think of it as for odds ratio specifically, it's, um, could you go back please? Oh yeah, sure. So uh, one thing that I actually learned was that for odds ratio, if you can't remember like the letters, one thing you can remember is it's the two that support your hypothesis multiplied together over the two that do not. Because you can see how if you're exposed to a disease, you'd think that you would get it. If you're not exposed, you'd think that you wouldn't get it. So that's the A and the D. And then, so the opposite of that is of course, you're not exposed, but you get the disease or you are exposed, but you don't get the disease. And then you multiply those two together as well. Cool way to think about it. So moving on to statistical variables. So prevalence is just the number of active cases at any given point, which is point prevalence, or over a given period, which is period prevalence. And then um, kind of on a similar thing, incidence is the number of new cases at any given point. It can also be over a given period, but that's less common. And then the attack rate is the risk of getting the disease during a specified period. And it can be divided into like a couple different things. So I just put here overall versus secondary. So overall attack rate is the total number of new cases divided by the total population. Whereas the secondary attack rate is just the attack rate of people who weren't directly exposed. So people who came in contact with someone who's exposed but weren't directly exposed. So usually that would be like family members or people in like, yeah, usually family members. So like if a kid is at a daycare and the flu is going around, any of their family members who don't go to that daycare who get the flu would be considered in the secondary attack rate. And it's just calculated to document the difference between community transmission of illness versus the transmission of illness to those not initially exposed. Cool. 
And then, of course, with every investigation, um, you have to consider errors and bias. Um, and just briefly, errors are just um, a deviation of the observed values from the true values. Um, and basically in disease, there are type one, two, three, four errors. And um, I won't go through all of them, but basically these are errors based on something called a null hypothesis. Um, and if you do a little bit more research to um, just uh, see what these four types of errors are, I'm sure you could um, successfully put it on your cheat sheet and understand it. Um, but it's just a good thing to know and have. Um, it's just about like accepting your hypothesis or, or like rejecting it or like accepting it, but it's like not a true value. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but um, it's just good to have. Um, and then just two like main type of errors are random and systematic. And a random type of error is a result of um, fluctuations around the true value. It's random. It's just exactly what it sounds. And a systematic error um, is any rent, um, any error that's not random. So it just accounts for everything else. And then in terms of bias, um, a bias is just a systematic deviation from um, the truth. And there are three main types of bias, um, but obviously there are a bunch of different types of biases underneath each category. So if you'd like to do more research, there are there are like maybe like 20 or 30 different other types of biases um, that are smaller, but um, these are just three main ones. Information bias is just information that's um, measured, collected, or interpreted inaccurately. Um, selection bias is um, that like the selection was affected by an unknown variable um, that was associated with the measured variable. And confounding bias um, is just a bias um, resulting from like a lot of mixed effects um, on several factors. Okay. Um, and then basically a lot more of this information can be found on scioli.org. Um, if you look up disease detectives, there's, there are pages of um, more detailed information about this. We sort of only brim the surface in this presentation. Um, so make sure to check out that resource. Um, and feel free to like contact us if you have any questions or anything else. Um, so now do we have any questions from the live stream? No. <laughs> no, I haven't seen any yet. Okay. Oh, so um, I see one. Okay. Thank you. So how in depth do you need to know about specific diseases is the question. It really depends. In my experience, I actually haven't really had to know that much about specific diseases, more about like the theory behind epidemiology in general. And pretty much uh, my experience with tests has been that it's not necessarily because the kinds of things they're asking are more general. So it's better to focus on other things rather than like specific diseases. Obviously COVID, you should definitely learn a lot about that. And Stephanie, you mentioned E. coli. So Salmonella, E. coli, just, yeah, I, I completely agree with Sarah. Like the majority of the test is going to be on epidemiology in general, statistics in general. Um, but there might be some sections where um, it would be good to know um, diseases. So I don't think you should spend a lot of time maybe like just look up a bunch of diseases and just know what they are. Or if you really wanna add them to your cheat sheet, add like one sentence about them um, to just sort of uh, give your um, yourself like just some general knowledge about them um, and basically what they are or like how they're transmitted or um, their effect. And obviously like you don't know, you don't need to know like mad cow's disease, just um, basically very, uh, mainstream and impactful diseases, um, like maybe like H1N1, or maybe you want to have the swine flu or Ebola. Um, uh, just touch on some pretty big, um, uh, pretty big like diseases that have caused major outbreaks. Yeah, I know uh, my team uses 
our cheat sheet that actually has just like a small column of, of a few different common diseases. Yeah. And that's it. We don't have like a comprehensive list and we don't have comprehensive descriptions of them, but it's always been enough. Like you just, you don't really need to know that much about specific diseases generally.